Oh, you did. Oh, word from the uh, pit at number six, by the way, Mike Raymond, as we just watched Peter Brock go past the pit area, is it's a broken lower front suspension on Alan Grice's car, so that's bad news. That's not a quick job. No, it's, it's not. front suspension failure that brought Alfredo Costanzo into the pits. Peter Brock continues on, car number 05. Still leading, 111.2 up over the Grice car, of course, but that'll be changing shortly. Second place will be taken over by the O'Brien Wixton car, Moffat and Fitzpatrick. A Ford is in the top three at the expense of one Tirana. Peter Brock, a very, very interesting driver and with positive views. Well, I guess I'm not really as relaxed as I seem to be on the outside. I obviously don't get the, uh, the outward signs of uh, 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 having a bit of a problem of coping with the situation that perhaps Alan Moffat does. Uh, I guess that Colin Bond and I probably have a fairly similar approach to driving or motoring uh, competition driving, uh, that we just get in the car and do it. But uh, I think that that does not really tell the full story I have to psych myself up, or don't have to. I tend to be psyched up fairly well before a race. I'm probably at my most nervous. That, that last minute or so before the flag drops is, is all hell. You're trying to sit there, concentrate totally on the, on the man dropping the flag and uh, what you're doing in the car is all correct, etc. But once the, the race is underway, once you've gone that first one or 200 yards, you've changed gear and uh, you're off, off and running, I find that it's a whole new ball game. It meant a lot to me with doing well in the Repco trial. Uh, I think a lot of the... Uh, Ooh, a lot of the cynics around thought that I'd blow up within 100 miles, but I wouldn't last. And I must admit that I, I was, uh, although I was determined to do well, to prove that a racing driver uh, was capable of, of winning a rally, uh, that driving basically is driving. And then although you alter your technique, your basic driving style doesn't alter. You're either, either driving a car nicely and smoothly or you're not. And uh, to get out there and succeed in the Repco trial, to me personally, was uh, uh, a very good feeling because I didn't really expect to finish, let alone win. The Touring Car Championship over the last two years has uh, been a very high level of competitiveness, particularly between two teams. That's the Ron Hodgson Channel 7 team and the Marlborough Holden Dealer team, and in particular, Bob Morris and myself. I would say that uh, in long distance races, though, that Moffat has probably got an edge on Bob as far as technique's concerned. Moffat drives very, very smoothly indeed. And Bob's finishing record, whether anyone likes it or not, over long distance races is pretty poor. He's had a lot of uh, engine blow ups and uh, generally the car just non finishing for various mechanical reasons. And this to me perhaps points to the fact that uh, Bob is extending the car beyond uh, what it can take. And while it can take it for 80 or 90 kilometres, it's a bit difficult for the car to take that sort of punishment for six or seven hours in, uh, in long distance racing. Uh, Moffat to me is the epitome of the professional driver. He's not a natural driver, he has to work very hard at it. And to see a man overcome that uh, uh, disability, if you like, and still perform, I believe uh, you have to give the man accolades. Top Japanese driver, Kiyoshi Masaki, is a visitor to the pits. He was to have been driving with Mark Thatcher, but of course the car has failed. And Kiyoshi, you have yes. driven around the track. How do you find the circuit? Well, it's uh, very strange for me because we have no such kind of uh, circuit I mean I mean ordinary circuit so uh, it's a uh, very tough and uh, strange for me now you've got a very good record in Japan you won several thousand kilometer races uh, at Fuji yes uh, in 1972 and 1973 I won uh, twice we are now in Peter Williamson's car the yes. bigger Toyota the Celica yes. he is going very well yes I think so yeah, I think so. Yeah, nice. going well, yeah. Now, put yourself in the seat with Peter. What's it like driving the Toyota down through these bends? Well, uh, we have uh, we have a very good uh, handling uh, on the Sharika, also uh, Toyota Corolla 11. So uh, we are going faster than, uh, I mean, a uh, three-liter class uh, racing car. Did you find it hard with the big cars and small cars? Is that a problem for you? Well, not really. Uh, I like uh, I like uh, small car. Any, I mean, any kind of car, you know, racing car. 
Peter, going very fast now. This yep. is the fastest part. Yes. How hard is the braking for the corner? Very uh, careful there? Well, yes, uh, but uh, well, it's very easy to uh, brake. You know, this, uh, we have no power uh, on, on, the, uh, on the racing car. Kiyoshi Misaki watching from the passenger seat of Peter Williamson's Toyota. The car leading its class, and Kiyoshi, of course, was with Mark Thatcher, but the car has expired, and two of our most interesting overseas drivers, Mark Thatcher from Britain, Kiyoshi Misaki from Japan, are now spectating in the pits. And add to that list Dieter Cuesta, because the Bob Morris Ron Hodson car has just this very second been pulled back behind the pit wall. It is out of the race. Once again in the Peter Williamson car going up towards the top part of the mountain. Hello, the pit stop we've been waiting for. Fitzpatrick. No driver change, change here at no. this stage. I think Alan Moffat would be delighted uh, with the way that uh, things are running. Just supervising, as you can see in the background. Berating. Quicker. Quicker. I think that Fitz almost took off with our backpack man's inside the car. 18.5 seconds. Had to be quick too because the battle in that second, third spot now with uh, Garth Wiggs and Charlie O'Brien and the Phillips Tirana is a hot one. And um, Phillips. Yes, Alfredo Costanzo, the co driver of the second place car. Okay. Alfredo Costanzo, a man who told me yesterday that he's in a learning process in the uh, for a Hardy Florida 1000. You're in second place, Alfredo. You're doing a great job. Uh, has it been a tough day for you? Yes, we had a bit of a trouble just right now. Uh, one, the front wheel uh, locked and pulled me to the right, and uh, consequently I ran on the, on the top of a, of a curb, and I think it damaged a little bit uh, the steering system. Uh, they fixed it now, and uh, Ellen Rice is out. So I, he just said on the two, two I ride that uh, the car, the car is not right. It's, uh, the alignment is out. You know. What is this going to mean uh, from a lap time standpoint? Oh, uh, lap times. I wasn't. I was only uh, within two seconds of uh, of a grace, but I was, you know, uh, I was getting used to the car, and. Uh, Actually, I, will, I think I was, I was going a bit quicker than what I expected. What, uh, what surprises did you have uh, in this race, Alfie? Uh, what supplies? I, I think I was running second at, at that stage. See, there's, uh, your, there's your teammate out there on the track. Uh, we had him up uh, on the camera a moment ago. Are you happy with the performance you've given today? Well, so far, I'm really happy. It could be a bit even heavier, but uh, it's uh, still a long, a long way to go, and uh, it's uh, really good. We stay on the track until the race is finished. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Alfie. Uh, As you can see from the camera eye view, the Peter Williamson Salika has pulled in for a pit stop. That's our camera car. Frantically at work, the boys, to uh, get this tyre change on, and obviously a driver change. Mike Quinn uh, has been driving oh, for the last. Oh, oh. Some smoke pouring out of there, or is it steam? steam. As you can see, there's our camera situated there, cleaning the windscreen, which would be appreciated by the millions of viewers around Australia. And ahead of the third place getters, the O'Brien Wigston Toronto. Here comes the Samson. Um, yes, car, the car 24, the recar car, coming for retiring. I don't think he's going to retire, but he certainly needs to do something about that wheel. Quite extraordinary, the number of punctures and flapping tyres we've had, probably due to the fact that we've had rain on the circuit, a lot of gravel and small pebbles have been cast about, and as Chris Economaki was explaining earlier, these are murder on the rather fragile racing rubber that all the drivers, bar one, are using. Car number 14. Ralph yeah. Radburn is actually driving. We were talking about Radburn and John Smith, and there's Radburn at the wheel. Well, they're uh, probably be quite happy to finish in the uh, in the top ten. Positions in the top ten have changed. Here's the details on Ralph Radburn's car and the IBM printout. You can see where he's running, how many laps he's covered, 
and they are doing very well up in sixth place side by side with one of the capris that shouldn't last for very long as the graphic shot from the helicopter illustrates as radbird puts his foot down and the big five meter v8 spears away from the three liter v6 and ralph radburn is running off into history as far as the capri driver is concerned goes past the spencer martin david mckay volvo a car that they entered to prove a point to try and suggest that it's the standard sort of car that should be racing here and they're making their point quite graphically not always to the happiness of other contestants but running around with great reliability and in the meantime the car running in sixth place with ralph radburn at the wheel the wheel comes round into pit straight pit straight once again uh, you may have noticed uh, just prior to our last couple of laps around with peter williamson we saw that very quick pit stop for uh, john fitzpatrick uh, according to uh, Evan Green, who is here with us uh, during the uh, telecast each year, that the, um, the knob on the gear shifter had worked its way loose and presented um, John Fitzpatrick with a problem. It sounds like the sort of thing that wouldn't cause you much trouble, but it's, uh, you just can't change gear properly. It's rather a big, heavy car to drive, and you've got to have the proper control which the knob gives you. Without it, he's in trouble. In the meantime, Gary Wilkinson. The latest IBM computer printout tells us that uh, Brock and Richards, of course, still in front with more than 123 laps completed. Three laps ahead of O'Brien and Wigston, back in second place in the Tirana. The Falcon of Moffat and Fitzpatrick, now four laps behind the leaders, 118 completed for them in third spot. But if you look at the bottom of that class now, you'll see that Peter Williams in the Toyota Celica, the two-litre car, not only leads his class, he leads all the three-litre cars and is in ninth position outright. It's all that extra power from the camera. 60 cars started, 39 remain after 123 laps. There are 45 laps to go, and goodness knows who's going to end up in the top 10. Again, here's the IBM printout, just giving you the rundown. Alan Grice has gone back to fifth after that long stop to repair the front suspension. Ralph Radburn, the man we are watching, is in sixth place. Seventh is uh, Gary Rogers and uh, Bob Stevens, who've worked their way up. In eighth, the Tirana from uh, Albury of Scotty Taylor. In ninth is Peter Williamson and Mick Quinn. And in tenth, another class car. This is a Phil McDonald, Derek Bell, Alfetta GTV in tenth place. So we have two cars, both two-litre cars, leading all the three-litre cars and all but eight of the big V8s. Quite incredible. Once again, the Breville Conrod Strait, as we see the field going down. The driver, of course, in the red and white Tirana needs no introduction. Former Australian touring car champion, winner of the Repco Rally, winner of the Hang 10 400 from uh, Sandown a fortnight ago. Pole position man for this race, leader of every lap. And aren't they accumulating money? The Coca-Cola Bottlers lap money, the Ingersoll Rand lap money, the Penthouse Magazine lap money, which has already started for Peter Brock. It's Alan Grice going through. And car number six after that very, 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 very lengthy uh, pit stop. I was speaking in the pits to John Harvey. He was telling me the problem that um, Ron Harrop had, which caused his uh, Holden dealer team car to crash just near this point. He uh, didn't dab the brakes enough. The brakes are down to the point where he had to dab them and Ron fresh in the car as we watched the, uh, the change there with John Smith now getting into the car. Ron Harrop apparently didn't do the dab on the brakes. Instead, he tried to push them, and he just brushed the fence, spun the car around, and out of the race. Just Must one of those things. A very good brush because it moved about three concrete partitions up there. But uh, We have uh, information from Peter Williamson in our camera car that he has picked up something off the track or he has run over something on the track and he has a hole in the floor. Are you sure he had me putting his right foot through the firewall? Well, it's certainly been working overtime uh, today. Uh, our director, uh, Phil Berry, has been in contact with the pits and is able to speak back to Peter Williamson. Is it something that uh, is concerning him, Phil? No, it's not at this stage. I'd say it's all the three litre drivers throwing stones at There were one or two cams on the track earlier. In fact, we saw one of the cars pick up one and spin it aside. And it may be some of the uh, 
debris on the track that has been causing tyre problems and now put a hole in the floor of Peter Williamson's car has been contributed by the onlookers. It was Peter Williamson last year, you may remember, who added some of the great drama to the race by trying to open his boot, which had suffered in collision with another car with an axe. Peter, we must confess, has an eye towards the nation is doing. And, uh, during that pit stop, when he had terrible trouble trying to open the boot with an axe so he could get into his fuel tank, which was enclosed within the boot, had another competitor run up and offer him a porter pack, that is a hydraulic press to open. And Peter said, get out of the way, I've got national television watching me. <laughs> and had another three good strokes with the axe. Ralph Radburn has got out of car number 14. Johnny Smith is in the car. They're running in... Uh, I want to explain that there is a handicap race within a race going on here and in the index of performance uh, category, Brock and Richards of course as well as leading the race lead that category, Peter Williamson Salika in second place on that handicap situation and the uh, McDonald Bell Alfetta in third place on the index of performance. We might uh, put that index by courtesy of IBM across the bottom of our screen just to show you the numbers because it shows that there's almost a three point margin. It's a handicap system but the balance of points will give you an idea of just how close it is because the Celica of Williamson and the Alfetta of Bell are exactly on the same number of points. So a great tussle there for second place, although uh, as you'll see when we punch up the IBM computer on the index, the leader has himself a, comfortable, a couple of comfortable points margin over his two leader challenges. But they are certainly closing points. up. Okay, we'll be going to Peter Williamson who uh, has a hole in the floor of the uh, Toyota. Take it away, Peter. Pan the camera down, Peter, and show us. is the understatement of this race. Let's go trackside now to Chris Economaki, who is in the pits. Take it away, Chris. OK, thanks very much. I've got John Smith with me here, who just stepped out of his car that he's sharing with Mr. Radburn. They're in sixth place. And they, he was offered a soft drink, and he said, if it's not a Mr. Juicy, it's not for me. Congratulations on never forgetting your sponsor. you got a big smile. Uh, what kind of a day have you had at the wheel? Excellent. Very good, Chris. Um, the car actually is running like a rocket. I, I can't get over it. I, I've heard a lot of stories about touring cars, and this has proved them all wrong. The car's going to be fabulous. Now, Alfie Costanzo had your background, open wheel cars, your Formula Ford, Formula Atlantic man. He said the big, the big thing that got to him was the body roll, the leaning from side to side. Has that been uh, noticeable to you in your car? Yes, they tend to wallow and leap, especially all around the top of the circuit, Chris. Also, I've noticed the lack of turning to a corner. They all want to go straight ahead. It's incredible. How, how, how hard a job is it uh, at the wheel, arms and shoulders and things like that, compared with a Formula car? Yes, it's particularly arms and shoulders. That's about all. Um, the rest of it is the same principles apply everywhere. you just got to learn to adjust to the uh, car and um, just see how you go. I, after about three or four laps, you get the hang of the thing, the way it sort of leaps and lurches, and, and you work to it. You, you've got to work as one unit. Uh, same with the little car, the little formula car. It's exactly the same principle as well, except that the, uh, the bigger car takes a little bit more work to do it. You know, uh, I had Mike Quinn over here, and then I fell his back, and he was soaking wet with perspiration. You're dry as a bone. How long were you at the wheel? Oh, I don't know, about 40-odd laps or something like that. I think it, um, it seemed to go fairly quickly for me. I didn't mind at all. I wouldn't mind getting back in it again. <laughs> 
Okay, we have an expression in the States that when a guy has an easy time, we say no sweat, and it really applies to you today. Yes, that's right. No sweat. Right, okay. Keep, keep, keep up the good work, and thanks for coming by. Thank you very much. Okay, back to you, Mike. Thanks very much indeed, Chris Economaki. Turn, don't turn engine off. That's the sign. Peter Jansen is uh, standing there ready to take over, and, of course, Larry Perkins is, is his co-driver. There's the captain. In previous years, Mike, of course, they had to turn the engines off with the old fueling system, but with dry brake, a much safer system, they can keep the engines running. But I'm wondering whether it goes beyond that, whether in fact they've got some sort of problem and don't want to risk having to uh, push start the car and incur a one minute penalty. Much more likely, I think. Well, Peter Jansen, uh, look at the concentration. Uh, yes. We, of course, met him in uh, one of the, our profiles a little earlier in the telecast. Um, a rather remarkable uh, character who enjoys all forms of beta sport. Long distance races, those just seem to be his special his special uh, um, goal, really, for a 1-2-3 finish. Anywhere between 1 and 3 will do. Last year, of course, uh, they were third here at uh, Mount Panorama, and uh, this year they're looking fairly good. They're up into fourth, and uh, providing uh, there's no problem with the, uh, the Alan Moffat, John Fitzpatrick uh, Falcon, if there is, they'll be back to third. The IBM company. Oh, here it is here. It's got a yes. some sort of a problem slowing down coming towards the pits. He has a problem, obviously. He's more than just a normal sort of slope. Maybe it's a tyre. Let's keep a look. Yes, yes, yes. indeed. Oh, another one. Another tyre. There must be a lot of debris on the track. And uh, Barry Perkins, ex-Formula One driver, bringing the car into the pits, going fairly quickly on the rim. It's amazing how fast they can drive without Broadway on the back. Can't go too hard, though. You can see the sliding and skidding there, or else they'll damage the back axle. Keep the engine running with the sign, the tyres, the jacks, the tools are all ready. There are the details about the Jansen Perkins entry. On 122 completed laps, they are fourth in the big race. And a uh, very critical uh, wheel and tyre change. They've turned and the motor off, despite what they said, the right rear side chalked on the rubber. They have turned the motor off. I would doubt whether uh, Larry Perkins would have seen the sign. He would have come into a scene of some confusion. Not just there, but all around him. There's quite a bit of activity around the pit wall. There's the dry brake system going in the back. And there's the wheel. You can see there's not a great deal left of the tyre, and the wheel itself damaged quite a bit. Although he nursed around fairly well, and probably no damage through to the axle and transmission. The big question is really whether the engine will fire. Peter Jansen being strapped in behind the wheel for what will be his last spell at the wheel. All going well. Oil being added to the big tank there. Dry sump engine system on most of these racing cars to counteract the enormous centrifugal force as they go around corners. Oh, it starts, so he hasn't got to be pushed out. Look at the, the grin. He's still giving a bit of a push, though, just to ensure that uh, 1 minute 18 seconds, by the way, in the pits. So it was a pretty quick stop, bearing in mind the fact that they had to change the wheel. The action keeps happening here at the Great Race, brought to you live through the 7 Network. Car 505, the Marlborough Holden dealer team, Brock and Richards, 129 laps completed and the leaders in the great race. Second place being held down by car 21, which is um, Charlie O'Brien and Garth Wixton. They're three laps down on the leaders, of course, and they uh, hold a margin of a minute and um, a half or so over Alan Moffat in the Federation Falcon in third place. They're the top three cars in the Hardy Ferrado 1000 at this stage. Interesting uh, to note, around about this time, uh, some uh, five years ago, the race would be finishing. It would have been the Hardy Ferrodo 500 miles. But now we go into, as they say, overtime, into the difference between the 500 miles and the 1,000 kilometres. And all the lap money, the lap money uh, presented by Coca-Cola bottlers for laps 1 through 40, Ingersoll ran laps 41 through 80 
and uh, now into the fourth segment of uh, the Hardy Frodo lap money uh, presented by Penthouse magazine from laps 121 through 163 means that the Marlborough Holden dealer team have picked up $100 per lap for every lap so far completed they have uh, also picked up the Motorola Communications $500 for the leading car on the 81st lap so they're in good shape there's the uh, Charlie O'Brien Garth Wigston car, uh, sponsored by Phillips. Very, very consistent car, and it's really good to see a Tasmanian and Garth Wigston and uh, Queenslander and Charlie O'Brien. I, I guess uh, for the uh, our Queensland viewers of our Hardy Ferrado telecast, who uh, are looking forward to seeing Dick Johnson, Ron Wanless, and so many of the Queenslanders finish, uh, you've got uh, one very, very good driver up there, really still hounding away in second place. If anything goes wrong, and we're not saying that it should or it could, with the Marlborough Holden dealer team, because that would truly be against the grain. They're so professional and they're, uh, they just don't have problems. But uh, just sitting back a couple of laps there is Charlie O'Brien, and he could, if anything does go wrong, strike a win for Queensland and the Hardy for 801,000. Charlie O'Brien, who last year uh, drove here for the Marlborough Holden dealer team, had a serious accident in practice on the Friday, and uh, it was not really his year in terms of the Hardy Frodo. But this year, things are looking good for Big Charlie. Second place, and uh, sitting there, ready to uh, strike if anything goes wrong with the leader. He's very well placed indeed. Still not a bad sort of bet for people who favour some long odds. He's uh, a most unusual character, Charlie O'Brien. You look at him, and as I said much earlier, you might suspect he was a professional boxer or a, an athlete who specialised in some of the more physical sports. A man from the Gold Coast area of uh, Queensland. If you want to know more about Charlie O'Brien, sit back and let him tell you for himself. Well... We're sort of here today full of confidence that um, we're certainly going to finish the race and to finish it well. There was any indication on how we were going through the week in, in um, private practice and also in, in time sessions. The cars have been going great with, with no trouble at all. So uh, even on Friday, both cars, uh, Garth Weeks and myself, qualified in the top ten. Um, so, you know, it was pretty wet then and uh, we weren't taking any chances, but we're you know, around the fourth and sort of fifth best time. So um, I think you know, today is, is going to be a race again played on sort of he who sort of uh, treats it with care at, at first. And um, if I've got a, well, I've got a fair bit to do with the space, but uh, I think we'll be sort of running around, if we can, around about the fifth place, um, keeping just a bit behind the leaders, and uh, but still well within touch. So that, you know, any time through the race that we can. We can get going and uh, sort of gobble them up, you might say, to uh, to be there at the finish. Good one, Charlie. Gobble them up, uh, indeed. Um, Charlie O'Brien, who provided us with some very entertaining motor racing um, for Sydney viewers who would remember our Amaru Rothman's Amscar telecast uh, during the course of the season. Um, some fantastic action and good finishes from Charlie O'Brien. And looking great now in second spot in the 79 Hardy Frodo 1000. I think we have another uh, trackside report coming up from Chris Economaki. Take it away, Chris. Right, thank you very much, Mike. I, when the race started, the 70 cars uh, were here, 60 were on the field, seven were on Bridgestone tires. One of those seven cars is leading the race, uh, Holden Marlborough, Toronto. With me is Mick Ryan of Bridgestone Tires, one of the happiest men on the ground. How close to uh, how close to the tires you find on the street are our racing tires, Mick? Well, normally they're quite a quite a different type of uh, concept for a normal street tire. But uh, here today we're utilising a particular type of uh, of uh, engineering um, achievement uh, in the form of a, a super bead filler. This this material is um, is designed to offer. Uh, stability under uh, extreme uh, uh, applications. Is this the first time it's been used? No, it uh, actually was used uh, in the uh, Repco Around Australia trial, and uh, fortunately uh, for Bridgestone, and of course for the Marlborough Holder dealer team, uh, we took out first, second and third places, and certainly a, a uh, very uh, encouraging uh, introduction of a new type of uh, concept uh, onto the local market. 
I see. I wonder if uh, that looked like a rally there for a moment on the screen. One car off the track, uh, but he's back on. And uh, if we can uh, have the camera down here, perhaps we can have a look at, uh, at what Mick is telling us about uh, in connection with the, uh, the new tire developments uh, that uh, Pete Brock and his co-driver Jim Richards are really scorching the racetrack with. There we have them on camera at the moment. We'll allow you time to set up down there, Chris. Gary Rogers was the car that our viewers saw, uh, who went off uh, doing a bit of rally cross at the end of uh, pit straight. Quite harmless, though. He just overshot, turned it around, and has rejoined the race again. There's a chopper view of Peter Brock out he, front leading. He's leading and doing it easily, but he's not necessarily going very slowly. He's lapping at the moment in about 2 minutes 26. Now, that's only five and a half seconds off his pole winning time yesterday so he's really going around there not just easily but so fast that it must be dispiriting the opposition yes he's a he's a pro in every sense of the word and uh, he makes it look so easy and that is the trademark of a very very good driver there's more action coming your way when we return to mount panorama bathus for the hardy frodo 1000 Able a um a, uh, a family of motorists to be able to uh, utilize a uh, the racing uh, the racing yeah, here is quite cool. hectic for for Mick uh, and at any rate this is the is the Bridgestone pleasure car tire and this is the part within in the center of it here that is used on uh, Peter Brock's cars. It's an adaptation. And what we're seeing here is the racing development coming back to benefit the pleasure car driver. So when they're buying a Bridgestone tire, it seems, they're getting a tire that was developed on the raceway and uh, therefore a better product. Back to you, Mike. Thank you, Chris. Uh, that applies, of course, to uh, all the tire uh, makers and developers who are involved in, in motorsport, not only Bridgestone, but Dunlop and Goodyear. In fact, uh, Michelin, all of them. You know, okay. Mike, uh, IBM will be producing an official lap history chart of today's big race later on, and if you want details on how you can get this uh, chart, get your copy, refer to the IBM ad in Tuesday's Australian. It's uh, quite a souvenir of the race. It has every car's performance for the full 163 laps. I have the chart up to 120 laps, which is the old 500-mile distance, and this is the man who's led all the way. The interesting thing is to look through and see how many cars remain unlapped, because... We have uh, up to 20 cars, and it was only 10 laps before he was starting to get among the top 20. By 11 laps, Peter Brock had uh, lapped all but 14 cars, and very quickly the number whittled down until, on lap 42, only four cars remain unlapped. That went on for some time until the retirement of John Harvey's car, number 26, which reduced the numbers. And then by lap 59, only two cars, himself and car six, Alan Grice, were unlapped. And on lap 85, Peter Brock made it just himself. No one else was on the same lap, and that's the way it's been from now on. But don't forget, if you'd like a complete lap chart which shows every car's performance through the whole race, look for the IBM ad in The Australian next Tuesday. We're following Peter Brock and the Marlborough Holden dealer team car around uh, the circuit. Beautifully prepared. What a, a great tribute to the... Um, the team chief John Shepard uh, who has just given a whole new uh, amount of life to the Marlborough Holden dealer team the cars are finished impeccably driven to perfection they always choose the right drivers I feel sorry really for Ron Harrop from Victoria who probably uh, could just run away and hide somewhere with the car placed in second spot to go out and uh, have a, a brake problem that probably some people could interpret as being a, a driver error uh, in settling into the car after John Harvey had done such a wonderful job. Uh, Peter Brock, of course, has had uh, great assistance from uh, from Jim Richards, and they're in good shape. Car 68, the white escort we're following, Bob Holden. Bob won this race 13 years ago, 1966. 13 is his lucky number. He used to run with it until they split the classes up. And Bob Holden, who drove with the Finnish driver, Rano Altenen, who these days specialises in rallies, won the car back in 1966, the year when, believe it or not, minis filled the first ten places. Incredible. Oh, we have problems here. Oh. Is that Alan Rice? No. It looks like Alan yes, Rice indeed. And there's oh. been a, a spin there. Now, what has caused him to uh, slide like that? 
he obviously has uh, some problem. Um, I think I can tell you, uh, when uh, the car was damaged before and uh, Alfredo Costanzo apparently hit a kerb and uh, broke the steering arm, the alignment is not right. And Alan Grice is driving there with a wheel that is poking out at an angle. He's heading towards the pits. I think he's done a tyre. I think that actually went because of the scrubbing effect on the rubber. He's coming in towards the pits, and Chris Economaki will be keeping an eye on the action in the pits. But Alan Grice, who was in second place and has slipped back now to be in fourth place, has come in the pits for that unscheduled stop. And lucky to have held the car in one piece, I'd say. It makes me wonder, so many of the leading contenders who have blown out tyres or had them punctured today, uh, Moffat car, um, just, well, just about all of the leading contenders, and the only car that hasn't is the dealer team, um, the 05 car of Peter Brock and Jim Richards. And let's just hope for their sake, it seemed terribly unfair for them uh, to lose this race out of picking up a stone and, and puncturing the car into the side of a, a wall or whatever. And there you can see... Uh, ready to put a new uh, tyre. I think, in fact, uh, while he's having a lot of trouble handling the car, maybe the problem which caused him to spin was the fact that the brakes have gone and he's putting new brake pads in. And I think the spin we saw was not one caused by the fact that the wheels are out of alignment, even though that's true, but it was due to the fact that Alan Grice had the choice of spinning the car or hitting something. And so we saw there the tail end of a great example of driver control deliberately throwing the car into a spin to stop it, having come down the straight at a speed that would have been approaching 165 miles an hour. Let's watch again the replay just to see. Now, bear in mind he's having steering troubles because the front end was damaged slightly. The wheels have been out. He's been scrubbing that wheel there, so he's had a lot of uh, stress, both in terms of his own physical effort and that being imposed through the car. And here he is. You can see him at the tail end of his spin and the consequences of it in the pits there when they change the tyre and specifically give him some fresh brake pads that are going to pull that car up for him. Bad luck indeed for Alan Grice, but uh, still good driving. Our chopper shot shows the pit activity. Alan Grice in the pits. Notice uh, we can't see from this high angle from our helicopter, but the asbestos gloves being worn by the mechanics to avoid burning their hands in this tricky job of changing brake pads because they would be at temperatures several times greater than boiling point. Get up to extraordinary temperatures. That's a good vantage point for the race. Exactly. Meantime, on the racetrack, Brock and uh, Richards Holden Dillon Team Tirana has uh, increased its lead and is now four laps clear. Four laps clear for Brock and Richards ahead of O'Brien and Wigston and the Phillips Tirana in second place. And they are a minute 17 ahead of uh, Moffat and Fitzpatrick in the Federation Falcon. Well, I think our viewers just saw the just how hot. Here is the um, Wigston. Charlie O'Brien car coming into the pits for a pit stop. That's the Phillips entry, Tirana. We'll wait to see how quick they can affect their uh, pit stop. They're Keeping down it. second place, a minute and 17 ahead of Alan Moffat in third. Well, well, this is a critical one then. A most important stop from the point of view of Moffat's chances. He's going by the pits now, and he's just going by while his rivals are in the pits. He's now then will be in second place. Alan Moffat has gone into second place. And once again, we have a Peter Brock versus Alan Moffat show. How many times have we had these two out in the front of the major race? Well, Moffat, uh, and I think our viewers would understand, although Peter Brock is four laps ahead uh, in today's Hardy Frodo 1000, anything can still happen. We've seen it happen in practically every Hardy Frodo race, with the exception of last year, where Brock led from, uh, from start to finish. Uh, what bad luck it appears we could also have a, a, a rear end or a brake problem here with the uh, Charlie O'Brien, Garth Wigston, Phillips, Tirana that yes, jacked the rear up. There will certainly be another stop for the Federation Falcon because Fitzpatrick is still at the wheel and I would think Alan uh, will want to uh, finish the race himself. Correct, but uh, going back to what we said earlier with uh, so many of the cars having punches, anything could happen. It looks like they're adding oil to the differential, I think, unless it's on the brakes. It's a bit hard to see. There's no individual labelling on the drum. He's been in the pits already for one and a quarter minutes, so it's a long stop. I think they're topping up the differential, so he's uh, obviously concerned about uh, transmission. Yes, they are. They've also had a problem right through the day with this car keeps jumping out of second gear. So under the circumstances, they've done pretty well to this point. They have done well because it's not the gear that you want to jump out of and uh, put about another two and a half thousand revs on the engine. They don't live that long. One minute, 40 seconds in the pit so far. It is uh, differential oil. And 
I would think coming up, uh, making a move towards the leading three in this race would be Peter Jansen. And we have two of the top contenders in the pits, almost one after the other. We have Charlie O'Brien and Alan Grice's car in the pits. You can hear the talk going on in the pits. Charlie O'Brien is out of the car. too hopeful. Garth Wigston trying to describe something. Adopting an extraordinarily agitated pose. Neither driver in the car at the moment, so they're not anticipating an early restart. Ella Moffat, one more lap on. A little bit further up, the class leading uh, Car in the no, it's not. It's another golf golf motors. The master. I thought we had to golf Gemini in the pits. Just had a report from the pits that the race leader Peter Brock will be in for his last pit stop in the next lap or two. Right. So the pits are suddenly growing very busy here uh, to be a very busy place. And with O'Brien Wigston and also the Grice car in the pits at the moment, that uh, would put um, Jansen Perkins in the third place. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, also keeping in mind, as Gary said a moment ago, the Moffat car with John Fitzpatrick at the wheel still has one more pit stop. You can see the oil. I think most of it's overflow from the differential and they are pushing the Charlie oh. O'Brien Garth Wigston car out of the race. It'll go to the back of the pits, but I think it's out of the race. Here's Brock Peter now Brock. coming into the pits. Are you down there, Chris Sakonamaki? Yes, he is. We're just waiting for Chris in position. This will be probably uh, a little longer pit stop, I would think. They already have uh, a good edge over the rest of the field. Nothing to really worry about. Peter Brock still sitting in the car. The second 10-gallon churn going into the back of the car. Peter's not going to change. They can almost make this a leisurely stop. Well, they're four laps to play. And they've got the sort of margin we haven't seen here at Bathurst in recent time. A drink being taken by Peter Brock. You can see him sucking through the plastic tube through the, uh, the cold drink container, probably orange juice or something like that. Bye, boys. And that was a quick stop. 34 seconds, a leisurely stop, but 34 seconds, the same time that they showed us in their practice run earlier today. And after all these hours of racing, they are still able to turn in a stop of 34 seconds and they've been out there for five hours 37 minutes so that's efficiency all through and that's what's going to win this race concentration a sustained effort for the full 1000 kilometers dura duration and peter brock probably with the race in his grasp but he knows enough about misfortune to realize that what could go on and he knows now from the long conversation he had with team manager john shepherd that the man behind him although a few laps back is his old rival alan moffat We'll be rejoining this competition in just a few moments time when we return you to the great race. And of course that'll be joined on, uh, on Mountain Straight very, very shortly by uh, Gary Rogers. AFCO Mountain Straight. That's, whoops, picking up the uh, back wheel there, I know. And once again, the Brian Sampson uh, brown car. Uh-oh! troubles for John Fitzpatrick the Alan Moffat Falcon is in trouble tremendous trouble smoke pouring out of the car from our chopper I would say there is a possibility they have blown an engine well that's the trouble that afflicted them at Sandown Park where Alan Moffat threw a connecting rod which is about as major a problem as you can have John Fitzpatrick staggering out of the car and that tells it all Bad John Fitzpatrick who was leading this year's Le Mans 24-hour race at the 14-hour mark, had a small fire in the car. His co-driver hit a rabbit, bent the oil filter, the oil cooler. When John was driving the car, the oil was dripping onto the engine. It caught fire. He pulled up to see what it was. Very minor, but before he could put it out, a zealous French marshal came along and doused the car with so much foam that he ruined it. Well, I think the Alan Moffat car has been ruined in a different sort of way. He is out of the race. Bad luck indeed. Uh, tragic though for the uh, the Ford followers, and they look to have everything just going for them. The uh, the Alan Moffat Federation Insurance Camel Feeders team for for this year.
that situation, of course, with uh, Fitzpatrick going off uh, on the way up. Uh, Avco Mountain straight lifts Peter Jansen and Larry Perkins into second place in this year's Hardy Ferrado 1000. Of course, the race leader still car five, the Marlborough Holden dealer team. Peter uh, Brock tooling along in front in no mean fashion, and he's uh, five laps ahead of Jansen and Perkins now in second place. Let's go to Chris Economaki in the pit area. Well, Garth Wakeson just stopped by to tell me that the pit manager has decided to put a new differential in car 20, and he and Charlie O'Brien will be back in it, providing they can get it put in before the race is over. Now, that's really staying with it. It's a long-time job. They're working furiously on the car now to change the rear-end differential and hopefully get number 20 back on the track before the checkered flag waves today. Back to you. OK, thanks very much, Chris, for that report. The AWA... AFCO Finance Camaro, as you can see up the top part of the circuit, still sitting there. Peter Williamson, still leading the class and doing a great job. Leading the class in ninth position outright. Also leading, of course, all the three-leader class, uh, class cars. And I would think up to, what, seventh overall? With the, right, yes, up to seventh overall with uh, the Federation Falcon retiring. Just looking down through the top ten starters that we had for our viewers at home, just to recap, I keep getting back to the law of averages once again. The top ten included Brock, Morris, Grice, Moffat, O'Brien, Rogers, Jansen, Cook, Johnson, Bond. Of those cars starting from uh, position ten back, Bond is out with problems. Johnson has gone out. Cook, do we have a readout on Gary Cook? Still in there? We'll punch up uh, Gary Cook and have a look as we come back through the... Okay, we'll take that in a second, where Gary Cook is running in the field. Peter Jansen, of course, who started from position number seven, has advanced to second. Gary Rogers, who was running in... I'm sorry, who started in sixth place, is still there, but having the brake problems that we've shown you before. Charlie O'Brien, who started from position five. As you know, they try to put a replacement rear end in the car. It is out. Car number 25, Alan Moffat, started position four. The car has blown an engine. Car number six, who started from position number three, Alan Grice, has had problems. You're aware of that. From position number two, we had Bob Morris in the Channel 7 Ron Hots in Tirana. That car is also parked. So there are only three out of ten starters in the top ten who are still in. The law of averages, uh, I guess, says that uh, out of the number of cars that have been running, that we must have some probably some uh, problem uh, with the uh, Marlborough Holden dealer team. I'm Let's not wishing that on them. Uh, on the bird's eye view of the circuit with Peter Williamson in the uh, Toyota Celica. Take it away, Peter. this very steep little corner going. Just a second. It's a bit desperate. Oh, oh crikey. You bugger that up. All right. Uh, we're just going to keep this thing together for another 25 laps. And I'll be the happiest man in Australia. And Australia has seen probably the greatest television movement I've never been associated with. The way this camera and all this electronics that this car has been functioning today has got to be to a... Oh, hang on. <laughs> More Henry Chester stuff. Yes, get rid of him first, Peter, then go back with it. Whoops, watch it. You know what's nice? That's a big car to hope or something. <laughs> They're dropping out like flies, Peter. Back at again. Back at the answer. Let's 
trouble. And uh, we're having a pump. The gearbox has gone right, so far. It's the clutch, but the gearbox is suffering from the from the clutch being a little bit. Uh, hang on. Whoops, 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 whoops. Got it. Good boy. Uh, the uh, synchros are taking a big hiding. Uh, we've had it all day, this Oh, there's Moffat, out of the race. What a shame. Big pun. Everything's OK. All pressure's good. I'll be looking for that flag, I can assure you. Here we go to Castro GDX car. Oh, my God. I just bounced up in the air. I don't know where you saw it, but... Oh, dear. I'm trying to keep everything all under control, and I've got to keep the pace on because the Alpha's setting out after me. Oops, here we go. Keep it quiet while well, that's it. We're just coming up to Reed Park, which is a very steep climb. I'm, I'm probably on television, you wouldn't be able to... That's right. You wouldn't really... That's Reed Park gates on our right. Castrol car. You probably don't appreciate the steepness of the climb, but... Here's the devil. Probably don't realise it, Bill, but right above me right now is, is the ATN Channel 7 helicopter, and they're taking this broadcast up through a, a tin can in my back window, and the helicopter has to keep up with me. And actually, Terry Lee, got the ball, is probably a better. when you're watching from, and it's a technical achievement that probably you don't really appreciate but I can assure you it's been a, an amazing association for me. Here we go, 400, 300, 200, on the angles. A few years ago, Jack Bratton took up the business there. We might, uh, thank you, Peter. There he goes. I won't ask him for a comment, but he has probably ruined four million lounge chairs throughout Australia today of people driving in this Hardy Ferrado Classic. Without doubt, the, the most magnificent contributor to this telecast and, and a, a real gentleman. And I think even uh, if he if he didn't win, if he was the first car out, uh, we'll have him at the presentation area to talk to him. The presentation, that's still a way off. Peter Brock's still in front. But as you know, Hardy Frodo, the 1000, uh, is becoming a graveyard for V8s. There's more action forthcoming when we return from Mount Panorama Bathurst. Size camera was working that camera in uh, B. Williamson's car. Uh, maybe it's just a works driver of the future. Talking of works drivers, the team manager of the Marlborough Holden dealer team, John Shepard. John, you're in radio communication with Peter Brock. He has a six lap lead. What special instructions have you passed on to him? Uh, none, basically, Evan. He's, uh, he's in charge, as I've said before. He's our managing director of that particular car, and he's, he knows what's going on, and uh, he's just playing it by ear. Are you reporting any problems at all? None whatsoever. Is he due to come in again? No, no, he's just going to stay out there. <laughs> He'll either stay out there until he wins or he won't win in that order, if you follow what I mean, because he's not expected back in again. In many ways, this must be the worst period in the race for you. Well, it's bad in 
some ways, but the thing about it really, you understand that things have taken their course and it's, it's, um, you just have to wait patiently, I guess, until the end comes, but um, uh, it's bad in a lot of ways, but it's, it's, I don't think it's any worse than the other period. It, it tends to get a bit boring after uh, maybe 20 or 30 laps into the race. You know? so say after 20 or 30 years, you need no. that sort of time well. before a thing like this can be up. <laughs> no, we won't talk about that. How much work has gone into preparing the car? Well, I guess three frantic weeks since Sandown. The car's been completely stripped and rebuilt, and new engine, transmission, rear axle, and you know, it's been renewed from end to end. Do you get the jitters when you watch him on the screen when you see Peter actually out on the track? Not really, because I've got uh, supreme confidence in the lad. He, he knows what he's doing, obviously, and uh, uh, he doesn't bring any bent cars in at all. And we're just, as I said, I'm being stupid about the managing director business, but he's in complete charge, and uh, we don't, I don't have the slightest worry at all. Peter Brock among the great drivers? Um, I guess the only bloke I would rate above him in terms of things that he's done, not so much in what he can do, uh, is Pete Gagan. Peter Brock is probably um, a comparable driver, um, and I guess uh, you know, I've got to be careful what I'm saying because I'm not trying to denigrate Peter Brock um, because he's, he's obviously the top around at the moment. I'm just saying in terms of scores on the board, Pete. Gagan is probably a little more successful, but not at Bathurst, so, you know, really, I think the pair of them are pretty top lads. You're talking of two great drivers. Yes, exactly, yeah. Thank you very much, John Shepard. We'll let you go back to your area where you can worry in private. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'll send you back now to Gary Wilkinson, but in just a minute, I'll be talking to Alan Moffat, and as we watch Alan's car, maybe I can keep going here. I've got Alan Moffat. Let me just uh, shuffle some headphones. Must be a, a sad sight for you, Alan Moffat, to see your car Actually, the bearer of so many of your, your hopes coming in like that. The thing I hate most is seeing it on that vulture carrier, if you want to know the truth. That, that's really the sad part. I wish they'd leave them on the track, actually. And apart from the fact that I think the trucks are there, that bit looks sad to me, to be on the back of that truck. What happened to the car? Oh, I don't know. I think John will have to tell us. Uh, it could have been, it could have been the engine uh, possibility, but uh, I suspect that the brakes might have gone. And, uh, well, as I was mentioning before, there, uh, there isn't much hope uh, for most of these corners. The, the brakes only just slow the car down. I know I have a little uh, complaint every time I get on this microphone, uh, Evan, but uh, I think really the, the cars are going just a little bit too fast for uh, the stopping power that we're permitted. And it might just be something that we're going to have to think about for the future. Well, now, it looks as though all being uh, equal, that we're going to see Peter Brock win his fourth race here on the mountain. You've already won four races. It'd be nice to be the first man to win five. Are we going to see Alan Moffat in action here next year? That one's hard for me to answer at the moment, and I prefer not to. Well, you're in a period of some uncertainty. You've had a pretty harrowing sort of year, I think. It must have been not only worrying and disappointing, but enormously expensive. Well, after a while, the money, you forget about the money. If you weren't prepared to spend it all in the first place, we wouldn't do it. Uh, I've never, I complain uh, all the time to the people that support me to get as much as, as we can to do the job. It's never enough. Uh, but I think uh, under the circumstances with uh, Ford not uh, prepared to uh, get behind the vehicles, I see very little point in us continuing to try. there and particularly some of the fans who tend to boo one driver and cheer the other imagine there is probably intense hostility more than rivalry between yourself and the top drivers on the other side peter brock john harvey bobby morris is this the case are you really you know bad friends enemies how do you feel towards them we're not uh, good friends uh, we're not uh, social friends but i think uh, the description you've just put forward is, is not correct uh, i certainly feel no animosity i have a great regard for anybody that can beat me because i know how hard i'm trying myself and there are uh, a great number of professionals in this country and you've just named a few of them alan moffat a man who's just suffered the crushing blow of seeing his car retire from this year's hardy ferrero 1000. now back to gary wilkinson thank you very much it's and uh, on the track at the present time we see steve Masterton in considerable strife. Yes, he's stopping. He has problems. He's the three-litre class leader. He's the three-litre class leader. And uh, behind him in that class, in second spot, up to this point, was car 48. And that was the uh, the Mazda RX-3 of uh, Barry Lee and David Clement. And this is going to open up a big opportunity for them. 
Well, we could hear the uh, the motor coming over that uh, top part of the circuit. Um, that's obviously uh, some sort of a problem with uh, with either the engine or uh, fuel feed or or whatever. But they've made their pit stops and they've been very very proficient uh, in their pit stops today. So it'll be a tragedy to uh, to see them uh, drop out of the race. Uh, I would think at this stage Steve would be trying desperately to get the car back to the uh, pit area uh, as quickly as he can. Meanwhile, the um, chopper following down over the top part of the circuit, the Ford Capri, sponsored by Masterton Holmes. Uh, Charlie O'Brien, who we reported earlier, uh, with Garth Weekston, who um, blew up the uh, differential of their car. It has since been replaced, and they have just uh, headed off out of the pit area, and once again up Avco Mountain Straight to come back into the race. Be a lot of drama in the, uh, the Masterton pits, I would imagine. Uh, soul searching to see what could possibly be wrong. The majority of drivers, of course, have their two way communication. Some go uh, without, rely on pit signals. Steve, I would think, yes, he does have an error. So he has um, two way communication to the pits, but it's almost down to a crawl in terms of the speeds that uh, are usually reached at this particular part of the circuit to wait in the pit area for uh, a report. Evan will bring us uh, up to date with what's happening there as soon as the car does come into the pits. My greatest concern would be whether the car has sufficient power to even make it up the, uh, the incline there into the pit area, but we'll certainly know the answer to that shortly. Uh, the John Goss uh, KTL Falcon is also in the pit area with the hood up. Um, John Goss is just sitting there waiting for some adjustments to be carried out. As we track the uh, Master Holmes Capri, Peter Brock just whizzed past then uh, on his way to uh, setting up an even larger lead over this field in the 79 Hardy Frodo 1000. Peter Jansen is in second place along with Larry Perkins. I think uh, that would be delighting uh, Peter if he finishes there. It'll be his best finish. The third. Ben and John Smith. They're in third spot. Here we have the Marston Capri and it hasn't made it. The crushing blow, uh, one of the smaller Fords um, withdrawing after looking uh, such a chance for uh, a class win in the three litre class. We'll just wait and see what uh, Steve, uh, when he steps out of the car, um, if there's any move to pull the hood up and look under it or whether just to park it. His crew are running down pit lane at the moment, heading down towards the area where he has stopped to see if there's any way they can be of assistance. You might recall uh, I was somewhat concerned whether or not the car could actually make it up the incline into the pit area, and it hasn't. That tells it all, doesn't it? No. Uh, and he hasn't been able to make it up because where he is parked is just uh, probably two or three metres before the Hardy Frodo Centre and the opening to the pit entrance. OK, the captain, Peter Jansen. Whip, whip. Second position, outright. And in the over three litre class, behind the Holden dealer team car five of Peter Brock. And Peter Brock on his 149th lap, he's now on lap 150, on his 149th lap, circulated in a 225. Spot on all day, this man. The man is like clockwork. I was quite surprised with um, John Shepard's comments. Um, I regard Pete Gagan as a tremendous driver. He always has been. I would have thought uh, maybe if uh, John had rated him so highly, we may have seen him actually in the Marlborough Holden dealer team. Have another one up here, number 15. Alan Taylor and uh, Kevin Kennedy there, Tirana, car 15, just taking uh, a short detour through the scrub and uh, having great difficulty. Now they're back onto the circuit, having gone off at the end of pit straight. Peter Brock, uh, what else can you say about uh, the driver? He is just absolutely incredible. Uh, they say a driver is only as good as his car. The car is always immaculately prepared. And a car, quite often, is only as good as its driver. That's Peter Jansen on his way down Revel Conrod Strait in second position in the Hardy Ferrado 1000, but six laps down on the race leader, Peter Brock. Redburn and John Smith in car 14, also a Tirana holding down third place. They're a lap behind Jansen and Perkins and seven laps behind the leaders, Brock. Then in fourth place at the present stage, still the uh, 
Craven Mile to run a car six, Alan Grice and Alf Costanzo. OK, I think we'll be going to the pit area shortly. Uh, Evan Green is uh, in position over there and uh, we'll have some more interesting uh, news coming from the pit area. Evan, if you're ready, take it away. Thank you. Well, Alfredo Costanza was running second in car six at Craven Mile, Tirana, when he had trouble and came into the pits with a broken front end. Alfredo, what happened? Well, uh, one, uh, one bolt uh, which holds the, one, the other arm on the, on the right-hand side of the car is stripped and uh, uh, the right-hand front brake locked and uh, forced me to go over curb, which, uh, 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 which I think I hit the helmet a little bit, but didn't make any, any damage. I, ma I managed to get to, back to the pit where they changed the wheel and I changed the, the bolt. And, uh, but the car is out of alignment now. And, uh, but uh, Alan, a few laps ago, he had another trouble. One, the left-hand side, the front caliper seized and uh, they had to replace it the front caliber so we lost another couple of laps there so we're running fourth now which uh, i hope you know, it stays uh, in one piece well a lot of trouble then for alfredo costanzo and the craven mile car which for a while looks so very good you're watching all the action in the great race is the leader in class and has done a great job against the odds here today too. Barry Lee. Of course, Barry Lee and David Clement, Mazda RX3. And of course, they were about six laps down in their Correct. class on Steve Masterton. But the uh, gearbox failure has put uh, Masterton out of the race. And Barry Lee and the Mazda RX3 leaders in the three-litre class of this year's Heidi Frodo 1000. Coming up once again, the top part of the course, I think, uh, I don't think they'd probably be aware of uh, how they're sitting in class at the moment. But he's still carrying on and doing quite a good job and uh, holding down a, um, a class win. We'll be having a look at our uh, IBM computer shortly to give you a readout on the top 10 and also the classes as we go into the the final segment uh, of a race that will be remembered as the Brock Bathurst. That anything that was up for grabs in terms of money, qualifying or whatever, was, was gone. Okay. Second is the Lee Gates car, which of course now assumes the role of, uh, of leader. Following the uh, dropping out of uh, Steve Masterton with a gearbox problem. You can hear it really whining away there. The gear change. Seventh, interesting there, the Martin and uh, David McKay. Um, car, of course, the standard Volvo. And uh, they've done quite well. They were aiming for a finish, and I would think... Uh, the best uh, they could uh, have really hoped for was a finish in the top five and they're sitting back in seven. So uh, they're not too bad at all. You can hear that high-pitched shrill with the gear change. Car number 48. The Lee Gates Mazda. It qualified with a 254.2. It started 29th on the grid. Peter Brock in the uh, old dealer team car five has 11 laps to go. This poses the question, has anybody ever led this race from go to woe before? I don't think so. Gavin Green, uh, who's sitting in with us, uh, helps us tremendously uh, through each and every Hardy Frodo uh, 1000. It'll be a first, Gavin? I think so, yes. I don't think any driver has led from the very first lap uh, continuously through to the finish. Well, this little fellow is uh, staring a good win. Of course, uh, the misfortunes of others. Um, sometimes you pick up uh, a couple of placings here or there, but more often than not, uh, uh, some drivers uh, who sit out there in, in front for possibly up to 100 uh, kilometres at the start are never seen or heard of again. Some extraordinary results, uh, Mike, appearing if you look through the entire outright position because of the attrition of the race. The leading Falcon is the Jim Keogh car, number 12, which is uh, now running about 22nd, I suppose, but with the loss of the Alan Moffat and John Fitzpatrick car, it puts him up to the leading 
uh, flag bearer as far as the Falcon is concerned, although he's behind some of the Capris, but a good effort by Jim Keogh. And even John Goss, who had such disastrous times early in the race, is now among the, uh, the leading 25 cars, so it just shows you what persistence can do. Absolutely uh, correct. Uh, the top ten will be an interesting readout at the completion of uh, this year's race. Really throwing that car around. Now the Falcon and Boffin and Fitzpatrick are still shown, although of course the car is stationary. Now don't tell me I put, put the mocker on, uh, yes, on car uh, 12. Is it that Jim Keogh's car, the leading Falcon I just mentioned? Goodness me, I'm going to stop talking about them. Yes, uh, it's, we're turning the Hardy Frodo into a Ford graveyard. Sorry, now I've got Jim Keogh here, and he said, no, that's Wilmington, that's Gary, not us. Gary Wilmington, yes, I was yeah. going to mention that, has been running uh, not too bad all day. Of course, his race finished early last year when he went into the, the Armco, about 200 metres back from where he stopped there. I've got Jim Keogh here with me. You can't see him, but I have a chat to him. Yes, You're sure. about the only Falcon left now, Jim. The only Falcon still running, Evan, and we're as pleased as punch. We've had a few problems with the car during the afternoon. We've broken a front wishbone. Uh, we lost a fan belt very early in the piece, and there's the car. You can see it there, not blowing any smoke. John Mann doing a nice job, taking it around very carefully. We've set the car up for reliability. We're driving at uh, maximum 6,000 revs. We've got a, quite a high diff in it, and our plan um, was to finish, and it looks like we're going to achieve that. It's going to be a finish uh, after a lot of strife and a great reward for persistency. Well, this is our first uh, ever finish in a manufacturer's championship race, Evan, so that we're uh, on top of the world at the moment. Well, look, How many have you tried? I think we've entered a, probably about 15. This will be your first finish? This will be our first finish, and uh, we look like we'll, we, we could well be in the first 10 cars too. Well, you must be as anxious as an Alan Moffat or a... One of the other top runners for a victory because it means so very much to you, Jim Keogh. Well, this one will mean a lot more to me to finish than for Alan Moffat to win, I'm sure of that. <laughs> well said, Jim. <laughs> and meaning nothing against uh, Alan, but of course, uh, John Goss has been in and out of the pits. Uh, it would seem that uh, the Falcons had started uh, today's race, your car, and possibly the Goss Pescarello car will be the only two Ford V8s to finish the race. Well, Gossie's had his share of problems. Uh, just 30 seconds ago he was still sitting at the end of the pit lane i don't know if he's still there now uh, they couldn't get the car restarted after an unscheduled pit stop i think that uh, they were up against it from the start because uh, john uh, didn't get the car to the track until thursday and just in his first two laps he crashed the vehicle and they spent the next two days in bathurst trying to repair it and so that uh, it was obviously a very very hasty preparation and uh, he was doomed from the start i would have thought Yes, uh, preparation seems to be the uh, the key to everything. Uh, one only has to look at the, the Marlborough dealer team for that, Jim. Just looking at our car running around now, I just wish that we had the mechanics and the money to put into our little car that uh, some of those cars out front are, uh, have put into them because, uh, I tell you what, those drivers aren't that much much better than Johnny Mann and I. OK, tell me this, uh, very interesting, but we don't really know the official figures of, of the big budgets of the, maybe the Marlborough Holden dealer team or Alan Moffat sponsors, but uh, what sort of money have you put into the Bathurst exercise for this year? Well, for this year, uh, we've put a, a very frugal effort in. Um, we built the car out of engines that we purchased last year with sponsorship from Radio Rentals, and uh, Melford Motors tipped in some money for us this year. Uh, I wouldn't uh, like to embarrass the sponsors by saying how much, but it was a relatively small amount. It was just enough to cover our uh, expenses, and we haven't bought any, virtually any new parts for this meeting. But we did build the thing out of the best possible uh, stock of our spare parts. Yes, in terms of, uh, of cost exercise, though, for Bathurst. Uh, oh, the, the parts involved in, uh, that'll be worn out uh, just in this weekend for our car alone would be probably between five and $10,000. Yes. Just the parts alone, let alone the hours of labour in it. Yes, it's, I guess it's very hard for our viewers around Australia to understand that as being a frugal exercise. People cannot understand how you can spend money on motor racing, but I'll tell you what, it's just like standing under a coal shower and ripping up $50 bills. <laughs> I think you have to be a spendthrift with a sense of humour to be out there. Yes, well put, Jim. Thanks very much for your time. As they say about motor racing, the way to make a small fortune for motor racing is to start with a big fortune. Jim Keogh, thank you very much. In the race at the uh, present time, the top seven cars are Tiranas, led by Peter Brock, of course. Eighth place outright is held by the Toyota Celica of Peter Williamson. He also leads his class, of course, and he's ahead of all the three-litre cars as well. The uh, Goff brothers lead the... Uh, 
1.6 litre cars and the Mazda RX-3 uh, of uh, Lee is the leader in the three-wheel class. Eight laps to go for Peter Brock. Eight laps to go for Peter Williamson too, who must be delighted uh, in the top ten. Looking good. Um, we'll check out the index of performance shortly. There was... And uh, we don't like to interrupt Peter all that often. That's why uh, our coverage from the camera car, we try to give you as much as we could during this telecast. We could have given you a little more, but uh, to put Peter uh, to the trouble of talking, it's an enormous thing for a driver who was trying to concentrate on, well, you've only got to look here to work out whether he should be right. The driver in front of him has just indicated uh, for him to pass on the outside. So all this going through his mind and to still try and continue in a motor race is just incredible. Our director Phil Berry, who is in contact uh, to the car, establishing contact with Peter. They have a signal system worked out, so we now know, uh, well, Phil knows exactly when he's prepared to talk. And he's got some traffic coming up here. This should look interesting for the car. He's got the, the car with Mann, the uh, Melford uh, car that, of course, Jim Keogh was talking about a moment ago. OK, Peter, off you go. Well, hang in there, I think everyone in Australia is riding with you. Well, it's causing me all sorts of discomfort at the moment. I'm really looking forward to the end of this. It's been a long day. This little thing, apart from the clutch, has been first class. This year, I'm not quite as fast as they were last year. Things are happening very quickly in these closing stages of the race. This has a lot of retirements. I'm just keeping a very good gap between myself and the Alpha of AOGDB. Alpha. So that I don't, I need to stop because of my leg cramps and change drivers. I'll have it, enough time to do so. But at this stage, I think I'll be okay. I've got Michael Quinn in the pits waiting. I'm running a trouble with my left leg. However, it's been a great day. You're right there, Peter. We'll let you go. We'll stay with you. Give him a break for a moment. He's a very, very tough part of the circuit to be concentrating on. Well, you're aware of what's going through a driver's mind. Relay to you live. Talking about cramps in the leg. Uh, it's been a long day for him. Probably more than any other driver in that field. He might have been up uh, leading the race with uh, uh, eight cylinders. But he's carried out a role that no other driver has carried out in a hardy Ferrado ever. There's the disappearing view of the... Uh, of the Jim Keo Falcon with uh, Man at the Wheel. You can just notice the speed difference there as the Falcon just runs away going down the straightaway. Peter's top speed was, I think, up around about 137. Uh, the Falcon capable of anywhere from 159, 161. A different view of the Hardy Ferrado 1000, and an exclusive view too. There's more of the Hardy Ferrado in the final, and the closing chapter is about to be written. We'll be back at Mount Panorama shortly. Go. It's this car, number 76, the Holden Gemini of the Goff brothers, that is leading the small car class. With me in the pits, Kel Goff. How are you going, Kel? Very well, thank you, Evan. We're very happy to report with so few laps to go. We're very confident being able to win this class, and I see from the latest computer readout that we're in fact eight laps in front of the next uh, Gemini behind us. The car is experiencing some problems at the moment. The um, front wall joint, the right-hand front uh, suspension is loose. Alan called in about ten laps ago. And um, my younger brother, John, who's in charge of the team this weekend, has instructed him to keep on going, drive the car to reduced laps to speed to endeavour to finish. And we're quite confident now to finish. I'd like, before we go, even to uh, certainly thank Recar. It's uh, the first time the Holden Gemini of uh, the Brothers has been painted in the Recar colours. We're very happy for their support. And also Kevin Dennis Holden at uh, Foots Graham in Melbourne. Their help is much appreciated. And if any more help was to come, we're uh, quite confident with the ability we've showed this weekend the car is still have a lot more potential left in it. And we're very happy the ARDC, particularly Evan, has uh, introduced this new class. It's a sign of the times, I feel, that uh, now that the uh, fuel economy is 
facing the nation the way it is, uh, with the smaller cars, now as competitive as they are, we feel that there's a great uh, benefit to show on the smaller cars today. So. Well, a lot of people, you know, were a little critical of the ARDC for putting in the small car class, but you're running in the first 17, and that's incredible. It is, Evan. Um, it's even surprised us, actually, to tell you the truth, that the car is as um, quick as it is. In fact, from the top of the mountain, Evan, um, right through McPhil before McPhillamy Park, in fact, um, coming up through the uh, uh, BP cutting and down through the uh, into Conrad Strait, we have found today that uh, whilst we can run this car flat out all the time, with a bigger car slacking off through uh, the top part of the mountain, we can outbreak them, we can corner faster than them. The only time to leave us to our frustration, of course, is down the front straightaway. Right, Kelgoff, an elated man with the lead that he and his brother Alan have. You can see there where they are. They're 27 laps behind the leader, which is what the minus 27 means on that IBM printout. They've covered 129 laps, and they're sitting pretty in the class, as you can see, with that more than six lap lead over the David Selden and uh, Leggett, Gary Leggett, Gemini, all Gemini so far in the small car class. Have you any idea how you're running in the index of performance? You might have seen those figures yet. No, I haven't, Evan, but I'm uh, judging on um, Rod Stevens' performance last year. Rod, I think, finished either ninth or 10th outright. Um, seeing as the uh, performance index is um, worked on a former, depending on engine size, as you're probably aware, uh, the Escort running a two-litre engine, now Gemini running the 1600cc, I dare say the former will uh, bring us right up as far as the performance is concerned. We're feeling very confident. I think that General Motors have a very good product here, and I trust that um, our performance today uh, shows that the Gemini is a car which is, we haven't been able to beat uh, on ourselves. We can throw it around, it brakes very well, it handles very well, and it's certainly a very ideal cut street car. It's Kel Gough doing the commercial, uh, and uh, doing... Um trip into the pits, car 35, he's going along the lane, whether he's in or out, I don't know, but another car visiting pits, as we watch the leader swing around, how many laps to go is it now, Gary Wilkinson? Four laps to go for Peter Brock, and uh, the finish of the Hardy Ferrado 1000 for 1979, and he will be, provided he maintains this position, the first man ever to lead the race from go to woe and pick up a considerable amount of uh, financial inducement along the way. We figured probably somewhere around the $50,000 mark all up. Yes, um, I would think uh, approximately the same, maybe a little more than last year. Last year, of course, $55,000. Uh, they've led every lap of the race, and when I say they, I mean uh, uh, Peter Brock and uh, Jim Richards. For Peter Brock, though, it will be his fourth Bathurst win which is incredible in itself. He ties the record uh, with Alan Moffat of four wins. Keeping in mind, he has won pole position here for the last three consecutive years. He has also won a number of Australian Touring Car Championships. Uh, I guess the next uh, biggest race to the um, uh, Hardy Ferrado could only be turned the 400 kilometre Hank 10 at uh, Sandown Park. He has won five of those. He has also won the Repco Rally this year. An incredible performance from, from this very, very talented driver, Peter Brock. There he is, at speed. Already the fans up on top of the mountain are cheering him on. Three and a half laps to go for Peter Brock as he heads on the way down to the dipper and then, of course, on to the straightaway once again. And it all seems so easy. As we've said so many times, the mark of a, a truly great driver, any driver who can make uh, racing look easy, and I suppose at home, uh, it just looks like a Sunday drive. Well, that's what it is to Peter Brock, with the immense concentration uh, uh, needed to, to win a race, to lead every lap of the race. Um, and, of course, John Shepard, who doesn't give too much away, looks like a very unemotional man. It's all a job to uh, John. He's been connected with many, many top drivers in past years. Um, Pete Gagan and, of course, Bob Jane, 62, is one that uh, is out. That's the uh, power cubular dolomite. Um, they've had some problems there, and that has come to a stop. Here he comes on to pit straight once again. And when he crosses the line here, he'll have three laps to go. In second place is Peter Jansen and Larry Perkins. They're heading for their best Hardy Frodo finish. Uh, they finished third here last year, of course. Alan Price was second. And I would think that would make Peter Jansen very, very happy indeed. Jansen... Uh, at the wheel for the final stint. Would be aware of uh, his standing in the race and uh, would not want to be doing anything uh, uh, ridiculous or any bravado needed to uh, 
there's nothing to prove. Uh, there's no way he can catch the race leader. He only has to sit there and conserve and make sure nothing goes wrong so he can lock up second place. Second place outright in second place in the class and in fourth place in the index of performance. Peter Jansen's Tirana. 60 cars started. There are 29 left. remaining. Here he comes, the captain, Peter Jansen, in the Cadbury Schweppes car. Tirana. Peter has done uh, uh, a great job also in promoting uh, the race through um, his uh, press association with um, the Mirror and also Auto Action. Uh, a very colourful character. It's great to see people like uh, Peter Jansen, whose sponsors also back the sport very, very strongly. OK, looking for a run-through, as we're giving you at the moment. Position 1, car 5, Peter Brock and Jim Richards. Position 2, car 19, the Jansen Perkins entry. Position 3, the Radburn Smith entry. Good to see that too. Position 4 is the Grice Costanzo Tirana. Position 5, the Gary Rogers Kennedy Tirana. In position number six, we have the Taylor Kennedy Tirana. Position number seven is Bo Seaton. Good to see Bo Seaton up too because uh, we haven't seen a great deal of him in the telecast in the uni part uh, Tirana, but running strongly. In eighth position, after looking certain for second, was Charlie O'Brien and Garth Wigston in the Phillips entry. Position number nine, a favourite, I think, by this afternoon's <laughs> effort, is Peter Williamson and uh, Mike Quinn in the Toyota Celica. And in position number ten, just look at that, the uh, small car, the Brian Foley Alfetta of McDonnell, Phil McDonnell and Derek Bell. So it's Tirana's one to eight and two two-litre cars in uh, ninth and tenth positions. Laps to go for uh, Peter Brock and for the race, and Brock just went round in 2:24, hot on the pace, just as he was at the start of the race. If the car is feeling good, uh, I would think that Peter Brock. I might be wrong, but last year, if you recall, he tried to put a blinder in in the final lap, just to prove that his car, his factory car, was running as sweetly at the completion of the race as it was in the opening lap. Not only has he run him into the ground, he probably wants to show that he could do it again if he had to. Yes. I think he'd be quite happy just the same to step from the car, probably have a cup of tea and uh, retire to the presentation area. There he is over the top of the mountain, absolutely impeccable. You don't see Peter Brock putting any wheel over the white line into the dirt. Let's watch him through here. Spot on, over the top of the mountain. Overlapping the, uh, the Volvo again. Listen to the crowd. They're already warming to the last lap. He has one and a half laps to go. And staring his fourth Hardy Ferrodo Bathurst win in the face. Over the top. Now down. To the wide open spaces of Breville Conrod Strait. One can only guess it's what is running through the mind of not only Peter Brock at this stage, of his uh, team manager, John Shepard, who remains absolutely cool under all circumstances. Uh, crews already starting to line the pit area to cheer on Peter Brock, to salute him. What else can you do? He's, every car that they have played has fitted. It's spot on. Here he comes, 05. It was the story in 1978. It is the same story in 1975. The one lap to go flag will come out. The signal has been given to Peter Brock. And there you can see on the right, the crowd in the pit road signaling this great driver. Ranks probably as, well, right in there alongside uh, Alan Moffat as one of the great touring car drivers in Australia. The record is on the board, as they like to say, going up um, Avco Mountain straight now for the final time. Not allowed to uh, snap in concentration because he still has uh, three quarters of a lap to complete. Here he comes. Faultless performance by the Marlborough Holden dealer team led by John Shepard. Of course, this car driven by Peter Brock and Jim Richards. 
not headed at any stage of the event. Just overlapping there, the 10th place car, the McDonnell Bell Alfetta, up to the cutting once again. And wait for the, the reaction of spectators, the thousands upon thousands of them up the top part of the circuit who will be down near the fences. You'll be able to hear their cheers. As Peter Brock, 0-5 for the Marlborough Holden dealer team, comes across the mountain. The man who has conquered the mountain three times and staring a fourth in the face. Here he comes. Listen to the applause, the accolades for a man among men when it comes to race car drivers. Still tidy. Picks up the inside rear wheel that time. Peter Brock is trying and trying hard in this last lap. It'll be known as not only the race in which this car led every lap of the race, but it'll be interesting to check his final lap time. We have a timer on him. Conrod straight away. There you can see Bathurst in the background. Peter Brock wants to see one thing and one thing only, the chequered flag for his fourth Bathurst. Hardy Frodo, 1,000 win. And here he comes down Breville Conrod Strait for the final time. No traffic to worry him. He's in good shape. It's been a long race, a race that this car has led every lap of down into the braking area, back through the gears. Listen to the crowd warming up. A checkered flag unfolds a page in history as Peter Rock and the Marlborough Holden lap. dealer team comes across to take the checkered flag for the Peter Brock. And you'll probably find that his lap time will read somewhere in the 222, 21, 221. He's done it. What a season for this incredibly talented driver, the man who only a month ago went round Australia in the uh, Repco Reliability Trial, led the 1-2-3 finish for Commodore. He's just picked up another Hardy Ferrado Classic, another 1,000 kilometre sprint. He made it look like a Sunday afternoon drive. All around the circuit are the cars that didn't make it, the ones who dropped out in the second and the third and the fourth the 80th, the 121st lap. Peter Brock's car just kept on running. The checkered flag is out to signal the completion of the race. The cars will return to the pit area. Peter Brock would be elated. John Shepard now believes it has happened. They have won the Hardy Ferrado once again. And what a combination if looking for the Grand Slam for this season. He missed the Australian Touring Car title by a very narrow margin to Bobby Morris. He won, of course, the Hang 10 400 at Sandown Park recently. And for viewers across Australia, here comes Peter Williamson to finish in ninth place. A remarkable performance. Peter Jansen going through for second place in the race and the glare of the sun as Peter Williamson Finishes off with his hand outstretched. The leg cramps won't seem half as bad now. And what a great performance. And uh, for our presentation right around Australia, so don't go away, we're going to introduce you to Peter Williamson, Evan Green, of course, lead commentator for our Channel 7 network. We'll be handling the presentation. And we have asked specifically for Peter Williamson to be uh, at the uh, control tower for the presentation. Peter Brock and uh, Jim Richards have won the Hardy Ferrado 1000 for this year. They've also taken out the uh, index of performance. They've led every lap of the race. They finished six laps clear when the flag dropped of second place getters, uh, Jansen and Perkins, also in the uh, Peter Williamson has won his uh, two litre class as well as finishing ninth outright. The three litre class honours have gone to Barry Lee. And the Mazda RX3, Williamson, as I mentioned, in the 2-litre class, the 1.6-litre class victory has gone to the recar racing team of Allen and Kel Goff in the Gemini. Well, there's the shot uh, coming back into the pit area. We had, of course, um, I think the figure was half of the field finished, 60 to 30. Not a bad effort considering the, uh, the debris around the track. And this is what it feels like, yet another first, to return to the pits 
after completing and just wait for all the people to converge upon Peter Williamson. Of course, the car that, um, that didn't make it. There's Peter, about to step out of the car. He'll be uh, joining Evan Green in the presentation uh, booth following the race. OK, we have uh, more action to follow the uh, how people feel when we return to Mount Verge on the Hardy Presentation Centre, where the accolades will be given, the cash received by Peter Brock for the Marlborough Holden dealer team for an outright win. Second place, of course, to uh, a driver who uh, would be very happy, Peter Jansen. And, of course, we'll be meeting Peter Williamson. The crowd all converging there for Peter Brock to uh, join Mr. George Hibbert and also Evan Green on the dais for the presentation of the 1979 Hardy Frodo Trophy. OK, let's go down now to the presentation area. Take it away, Evan Green. And it's all yours. Well, something like pandemonium here at the finish of the Hardy Frodo 1000. We're waiting at the moment for Peter Brock, Jim Richards and team manager John Shepard to fight their way through the crowds. There are thousands of people around the Hardy Ferrodo Tower, just waiting on the presentation of prizes. And all the way victory to Peter Brock, the first time it's ever been done. I, I don't know whether he knows just how much money he's won, but by a very rough calculation, it's somewhere in the vicinity of $63,000. So it's been a fair day's work. We're waiting on Peter Brock, John Shepard, and Jimmy Richards to come up here to the tower. And the class winners will be speaking to them afterwards. Very quick around the circuit, very slow getting to the tower. It's been a great race, George Hibbert, the general manager of Hardy Freda. You've watched them all? Yes, number 12, Hardy Freda this year, Evan, and it's been a superb race. It's been a lot of disappointments, but some brilliant driving on the part of uh, Peter Brock. I, th I think the cheers yes. indicate that he's here. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of this year's Hardy Ferrado, and now he has four victories in Australia's greatest race, Peter Brock. Thank you uh, very much, Evan. Uh, an absolute dream run for us. Uh, from the word go, the car was uh, really on the ball, and uh, we drove it fast all day. We didn't have to slow down for any reason. And uh, it was a matter of, I think, just outrunning the field, really. Was there any time during the race when you were worried? Any time at all? About the one-minute board, I think. I hoped I wouldn't make a start like I did last year, which was a dreadful start for the race. Uh, no, once I got the lead and I drew away uh, in the early laps, and I was doing it very easily, and I thought to myself, uh, I think we're going to have a very easy run here today. Uh, but I couldn't understand why we were really that much quicker than the opposition early on. Uh, the car finished off very, very well. Temperature gauge never went off uh, 90 degrees Celsius for the uh, water, about 95 for the oil all day. And uh, that's, I think, an absolute tribute to John Shepard and Bruce Nowacki and the boys who built us a car which is uh, absolutely capable of taking the 1,000 kilometres in its stride very easily. Let me introduce your co-driver. Once from New Zealand, we'll still call him an international driver, but almost from Australian, Jim Richards. Well, first, we'd like to thank uh, Peter for a start. He did a lot, most of the work. Uh, but a lot of thanks to John Shepard, the Holden dealer team, and all the boys looked after the car. They did a great job, and I'm just very happy to be part of the team. Thank you. I don't know whether John Shepard is overcome with emotion or not. It'd be most unlikely if he was. Let's bring the team manager up. No, I wasn't overcome with emotion, Evan. I was just I was thinking to myself at these presentations, people perennially say, oh, thanks very much to the mechanics for a nice car. And I think it's time that the mechanics said thanks very much to the driver for looking after it so well and driving it so quickly. And also uh, take the opportunity to thank the boys in the crew who did an excellent job, as is obvious by the way the car finished. Brock. Let's bring you back to the microphone. We're about to call upon uh, George Hibbert to make the presentation to you. The general manager of Hardy Ferrado, the man we could truly call the father of this race. George Hibbert, please come up to the microphone. Mr. Peter Brock. Congratulations. 
Peter. Thank you, George. You and I are becoming uh, quite <laughs> good friends. Quite a habit, quite a habit. Fourth, uh, is your fourth victory at Bathurst? You yes, beat Alan Moffat's record? Yes, that's right, yes. Three years pole position. That trophy you presented yesterday, that uh, you must have a line of those on the mantelpiece now. Yes, I'm uh, doing well there, George. <laughs> Thank you very much. But anyhow, uh, sincere break. congratulations to you. And also, if I may, to Jim Richards. Yes. And for this marvellous pair of motor cars. John Shepard. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we have the honour of having with us the doyen of American motorsport, one of the most uh, famous figures in Indianapolis, editor of one of the most uh, outstanding uh, motor journals in America, Mr. Chris Economaki. And I've taken the opportunity to call him up, having uh, been honoured with his presence in Australia, to call upon him to make the presentation to Peter and Jim and to John. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to say that I've traveled the world to see motor races. Today I've seen a world-class event, won by a car that is prepared the likes of which I've never seen. There's not a drop of oil on it. It looked like it just came through a wash job, driven magnificently by two great drivers. My congratulations to all three. May I have the team managers there. John, you really deserve this. The car never skipped a beat, and I'm, I'm always looking for oil leaks. There's nothing there. Congratulations. Thanks, Chris. As I said, it's not uh, completely my trophy. It belongs to the boys in the crew who uh, obviously did quite a lot of work on the car. I just stand by and watch them most times. Well, may you have many more. Pete, I watched you on the track. You ran away with it. You spoiled the show, so to speak, and that's Sorry, the way Chris. to win them. From the front row, start on the pole, you collected all the lap money. And in the United States, you're a hog. You deserve this. Let's hope you win four more. Thanks, Chris. that in the States you would probably draw out the yellow flag to close things up a little. We had a few spots of rain there, but uh, we handled that okay. Uh, no, I'm thrilled with today's race, and uh, it's, uh, as you said, uh, the, the next thing to try to do is try and win five, and uh, we see you can win more Bathurst than anyone else. Thank you very much. Your co-driver deserves a lot of credit. Come on up here and get your hard work to be in the shadows of a great man like Pete Brock, but uh, everyone has to have assistance, and I don't think anyone in today's race gave a better job of support than this gentleman here, Mr. Richards. Congratulations. Thank you again. Oh, he's a big talker, Jim Richards, isn't he? You know, one of the uh, newer features of the Hardy Prado 1000 is the index of performance. It's, in effect, a handicap system which is designed to recognize the greatest improvement in vehicle design, the greatest improvement in driver abilities. Ivan Stibart and the ARDC go to a lot of trouble working out a formula that will encourage the smaller cars and give them a chance against the big ones. It's designed on past class performances, and the man who wins has to improve by the greatest amount on that previous class victory, and that favours the small cars. And do you know who won the index this year? Peter Brock. <laughs> Before we hear from Peter once again, it's time for Channel 7 viewers to take a pause and remind them we're watching the presentation of prizes for the great race. Huge race, and in fact, a feature when you compare it with the long history of telecasts, had been the fact that for the first time we could take viewers inside a car. The car driven by Peter Williamson and Mike Quinn. All you here in front of the Hardy Predators, and I'd love you to have heard the commentary that Peter Williamson gave from the car. It was fabulous. And just to top off a great performance, Peter Williamson won the two-litre class in the Toyota Celica. Peter. Congratulations, Peter. Step up here for a minute. Your co-driver. You know, you're, right, you're the head of the telecast. People are calling Channel 7 in Sydney wanting to know, how can you do that? And not only did he have a camera in the car, he spoke to the viewing audience. Was that a distraction for you during the course of the race? Well, uh, no, because I, I, just, I don't recall what I said. I just <laughs> said what was in my, 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 my brain at the time. And, well, and if came... I said anything wrong, I, please forgive me. <laughs> no, no, it came across very well. But you don't know what the dialogue that went on behind your thing. When you said there was a hole in the floorboard, one of the people in the truck said, tell him to turn the camera down so we can have a look at it. So uh, I hope they never told you that. <laughs> well, that's it. You did a great job, and your class victory was even more remarkable because you finished, uh, polished off the three-liter cars, I understand. Yeah. That's, that's not easy to do. Peter Williamson and Mike Quinn in the Toyota Celica, uh, a great class win. 
And here are your mementos. I hope you'll find a, pl a place of honor in your homes. Congratulations, gentlemen. Uh. I suppose, I suppose no, nobody here has ever seen a humble car dealer before, but uh, here's one. I'd like to thank uh, Mike. He did a great job. We wrapped about the same times. We did. We kept it, kept the pressure on. It, we had a very hard race. Uh, we had a lot of trouble last night, with, and we had a lot of assistance from Castle, and I thank them. Uh, we we had a long, long race with that Alpha Alfetta GDV of Foley's. Uh, we finished after a thousand kilometres, only one minute twenty seconds in front of him. And, uh, and I'd like to thank you for letting us win, uh, Brian Foley. Uh, I'd like to thank Reg Varley, Stephen Branch, and all the team. Uh, they work so hard. And, uh, uh, and all your people for coming here and making it such a great event. Thank you very much. Now, I know you'd like to... <laughs> I think you might have recognised the fellow I was going to introduce you to. Well, this is Larry Perkins. And the anonymous character here is Peter Jansen. Peter, a few words. Outright second. Thank you very much. On behalf of Larry and I, <laughs> he did all the hard work. We didn't come from America. We came from Melbourne to give it a decent go. And um, we're very happy. We'd like to thank Cappy Schweppes, Hertz and Recar and all the other multitudes who were there. And we really enjoyed it. I had a spin down there when I started to pick my nose and something went wrong. Anyway, <laughs> I've got to go and see the dry cleaners and the laundry mat now. I'd like to say thank you to everybody and the great backing you gave us when we went around the mountain. Larry and I really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. The winners of the small car class. From Victoria, those two great brothers, Alan Goff and Kel Goff. In the Holden Gemini. And the car was prepared by their brother John. A real family effort, Kel. Thank you very much, Evan. It's been a, uh, a real pleasure to be here today. We've tried uh, twice before in the Gemini. It's uh, one of the slower cars, as you probably appreciate. It's, in fact, the smallest engine car in the race. There's nothing more frustrating than he passed by the big V8s, but we can only say we're very happy to see the little car finish, particularly in light of uh, being two of the works cars, the works Toyota and the works Golf. I think it's a credit to uh, both Alan and my younger brother John, more particularly in the preparation of the car. Alan is the driver and the sole mechanic on the car himself. And we'd like to thank ARDC for the 600cc race. And thanks a lot. Next year we'll be up here and we'll burn them off again. <laughs> Fighting words from Kelgoff. The winners of the 3 litre car and a bit of a surprise and a real reward for consistency, Barry Lee and John Gates. In the Mazda RX3, almost off time, Barry, but a great effort. You must be a little surprised. And sheer tenacity paid off. Well, we ran at sand. We had a win at Sandown. We just ran to finish. Uh, our plan was we were lucky we qualified pretty well. We had a couple of problems uh, earlier in the race, but we, we never missed a beat after that. And I'd like to thank John Tinock, who works for me and prepares the car, and also for the job that John did. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. And now to close up, as far as the telecast is concerned, it's back once more to Mike Raymond. Thank you very much, Evan. Uh, beautifully handled, wonderful presentation. We certainly hope that throughout Australia today you have enjoyed what we believe to be a first in outside telecast, bringing you live from a race car, the description by the drivers, and to all the people who helped make this appointment with motor sporting fans a reality under some difficulty, we say thank you for watching. Thank you, Gary Wilkinson. Thank you, Chris Economaki. Thank you, Evan Green. <laughs>